Clay Highbloom interviews Jesus on the subject of Christian religion. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 18th of March 2013. This is session two, part one. Hello again. Uh, Claire Highbloom is interviewing me again about the subject of Christian religion. Claire has uh, prepared a number of questions that we didn't get to cover last time. This uh, presentation will be in, in included as an interview as well as a set of frequently asked questions. So for that reason, we're going to have a little pause after each of the numbers that, so that we can discuss them. But we also want to have a discussion about these particular things that Claire wants to know the answers to. So let's proceed with our questions on the second session Very good. of re Christian religion. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Now, number one. How can heartfelt false beliefs and false doctrines be overcome? Yeah, with a lot of difficulty, Claire. Mm. Um, the problem with a heartfelt uh, belief is that, it, that it's usually supported by a foundation of emotions that are all based around unloving belief systems and, and, and lies generally. So the problem with... And I'm not saying that all heartfelt beliefs are like that. I'm just saying the ones we need to give up are like that. Yes. So the, the problem with heartfelt beliefs is because they have all this emotion behind them, it is very, very hard for a person to actually give them up. And there are really only a few things can, that can set us free from heartfelt beliefs that, that we feel are true inside of our mm. heart but actually are not a part of God's truth. Mm. And the, this involves two primary aspects of our development towards God. The two primary aspects are humility and truth, a mm. love of truth. Yeah. Now, if we are truly humble, we are willing to experience every emotion we have without, take, without acting upon the emotion that we feel. So for example, with the, oh, here we got a wasp going in our <laughs> direction. And um, without, and what I mean by that is that we need to start contemplating this fact about humility: that while we have emotional resistance inside of our heart to something being presented to us, it is telling us the truth that we are not as certain mm. about our belief systems as we believe ourselves to be. So, for example, if you told me, AJ, you're definitely not Jesus as far as, you know, I know you're not Jesus, I'd say, no worries, Claire. You're able to have your own opinion. I wouldn't feel angry with you. Yeah. I wouldn't feel upset with you. I wouldn't feel like attacking your character. I wouldn't feel like attacking your nature. I wouldn't feel like attacking your personality, your clothing or any other thing about yourself. If I did feel any of those emotions it would mean that inside of myself perhaps there is also an uncertainty mm -hmm. that I, of my own acceptance of myself. Does that make sense? Yes. It is, it is my own uncertainty and my desire to suppress it that would cause me to react ne negatively mm -hmm. to your accusation, whether it's delivered in love or unkindly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something we need to understand, is that whenever we refer to a, sort of like a defence of our belief systems and revert to anger or other types of emotions as a defence and revert to attack of the individual themselves who is questioning us, we are actually demonstrating that our belief systems are not as firmly in our soul mm -hmm. as we would like them to be. So perhaps they're not as heartfelt mm. as we would really like them to be. Mm. So what I find a lot of people doing with regard to their belief systems is that they feel the confrontation of the truth with their belief system. So the truth is stating one thing, or anybody, let's call it, at this point in time they don't even believe it's the truth, right? There's just a, an, an idea, a knowledge, that is different to the knowledge they have. When there is this confrontation between the knowledge and the knowledge that a person has, the actions of truth will determine which one of these things is true. Yeah. Now let me talk about the actions of truth. The actions of truth are that it would never give up itself 
for the sake of a compromise with another. So in other words, if you tell me that I am not Jesus and I know for certain that I am, I will not give up my feelings of certainty for your belief. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. However, I will also not attack your beliefs. I will accept that you are allowed to have your belief that I am not Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. I would do that automatically if I was in a condition of love and if my belief had any certainty. I would also do that. If I start attacking you for your concept, then that would demonstrate that I am trying to defend something. And if I'm trying to defend something rather than just expose something, now I'm in a condition where I am probably in error. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if we understood this where, uh, when we're in a discussion about any theological subject, we would start to feel the defensiveness rise within ourselves and realise that in that moment we are not being humble. Yeah. Because humility would allow us to listen to the, the discussion, particularly if the other person is delivering it in a kind manner in particular. Mm -hmm. You, you would listen to the discussion. If they weren't kind, then you would say, hey, you're not being kind and I don't have to put up with this Yeah. And, and, and perhaps leave. But if they were being kind, they were just raising a subject with you and there was a, you know, they weren't being condescending or ridiculing in the process, then there was no need to talk to them about their emotion about it. There's just a need for us to experience our own emotion. Mm. And if we're feeling attacked, even though the person is being kind, then obviously there's a deeper emotion within us that is sure. demonstrating some kind of untruth or some kind of thing where we're not being loving. Right? Now, so this is the first quality. The first quality we need is humility. The ability to absorb another person's different opinion without reacting in anger and resentment towards the person. The ability to listen without, without or Im immediately denying something. Now, I notice that this is a difficulty for many people who have a Bible or a book to believe in. Mm. So, you know, when, we talk, mm. uh, when I've talked to Muslim people and we start talking about the different things that the Koran says, it's very often the same response to when I start talking to Christians about what the Bible says. Because they want to believe that the Bible is God's word, or in the case of the Muslim, he wants to believe that the Koran is God's word. And whenever I state, well, I can't see how it's God's word because it says this or because it says that and I can't agree with that concept of God, they then feel attacked by that particular disagreement, mm. if you like, between, of, of opinions. Now, if a person is truly humble, even if they feel attacked, they won't attack in return. Mm -hmm. mm. They won't verbally abuse the person. They might withdraw from the situation but they, might, they wouldn't verbally abuse the person or attack. And they would at least be open to logical reasoning. Not reasoning based upon character assassination or, or pulling down mm. someone's character or nature, but reasoning based on the subject that's being discussed in terms of what must be true and what can't be true, in terms of a logical argument. They'd be open to that if they were humble. Mm, sure. So I feel the very first thing in, in this part of the question that you've asked is that we need to learn humility. Yes. We need to know, know what it means to be humble. The second thing we have to do is to have a deep desire for truth. We need to place truth as more important than our own emotion. So in other words, let's say my emotion in you saying that I'm not Jesus is, oh, another person who doesn't believe, you know, that might be my emotion. I would still place the truth above that emotion. So in other words, I would, I would enjoy the fact that you have expressed the truth of your own opinion. Mm -hmm. And I would honour the fact that you've expressed the truth of your own opinion, even if I don't agree with it. Does yes. that make sense? Yeah, of course. So I would honour truth in the person that's speaking with me, and I would honour truth as an absolute. Both of those things. Both of those things would be something I would do. I will honour the truth as an absolute as well as a truth of the opinion being expressed. So I enjoy it when people honestly mm. express their opinion, even if I can't agree with their opinion. Mm. 
you can then engage the person with the heart. With yes. the heart. Yes. Now, if a person does both of those two things, if they honour the truth with all of their own heart and they honour what potentially could be God's truth with all of their own heart and they are humble, then it is easier to give up heartfelt beliefs that logic demonstrates must be incorrect. Mm. But if a person is not humble and does not honour the truth with all their heart, then it will be very, very difficult to give up beliefs that a person believes is correct. Now, the reason why we find it difficult to give up beliefs is because they have emotional signatures attached to the belief. So for, if I can give an example of that, let's say um, I've grown up with the belief that when my mum or dad smack me, according to the Bible, they're loving me. Mm -hmm. So I've grown up with this belief that, that God punishes those whom he loves or God corrects those whom he loves through punishment, right? And I've also grown up with the belief that my parent loves, loves me even when they've been violent towards mm -hmm. me. So that's the belief I've grown up with. Now, that emotional signature that exists inside of me then makes it easier for me to believe in a God of wrath, a God who will violently act towards the wicked as well as love me. Mm. Right? Yeah. If I did not have that emotional signature, then I would find that belief very difficult to stomach. And this is where we need to come to understand that actually our heartfelt beliefs may be false. Mm. And they may be false because we've grown up in an environment mm. that is out of harmony with love and we've accepted that environment as loving. Yes. We've accepted something that is loving that is not inside of ourselves emotionally. And as a result of that, we become emotionally attached to belief systems that support our unloving nature. Mm. And, and if we are wise, we will recognise that. Mm. And so in any discussion, we'd go, oh, OK, there's, there's, there's a few possibilities here. There's a possibility that Claire's right. There's a possibility that I'm right. And there's a possibility also that the reason why I'm wrong is because I've got all these emotions inside of me that tell me that I'm right. <laughs> and I don't want to give them up. Mm, mm. And so the only way I'm going to do that is by being humble. Mm. So I feel, I feel in answer to your mm. question, the primary thing is humility. Mm. Another thing is having this really honour of the truth. Mm. But the third thing is having this understanding, this underlying understanding that all of my life I've been absorbing belief systems, some of which may be wrong, mm. but which I believe to be true mm. because I've grown up in an environment that has taught me that the unloving is loving. Yes, yes. And that's the reason why I have them. Yeah. And if I am open and humble to those concepts then I will find it relatively easy, although not emotionally easy necessarily, but relatively easy mm. to engage a logical discussion where something can be exposed as, as false. Mm. Mm. If I don't engage those concepts, then I'll always resist what is, what is coming at me, whether it is true or false. Yes, yes. As soon as it disappears, agrees with my own opinion, I'll, I'll automatically dismiss it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend most Christians to do, is to develop those qualities of humility, this strong love of truth, mm. not, not focusing on whether the Bible is true, mm. but focusing on whether the logic is in the argument that the person is presenting or not. Mm. And if the logic isn't in the argument, then of course don't accept it as truth. Or if the logic may be flawed, then say, OK, we need to consider this further, you know, discuss it more. We need to have, be open to a further discussion mm -hmm. on this matter. But when you see quite clearly that the logic is flawed, not based on the Bible or some Bible verse, but based on the principles of love, truth and humility, then you will be able to easily, more easily determine what is true and what is not. I'm thinking especially for the person who passes, for the spirit ah, yes. who passes, and then their face, they must... They must make a step then. And this is, to me, yeah. where love is going to, where, where the desire for, for truth is going to be so important. For so them. important. But also the humility too. Of course. These yes. principles that I've, I've mentioned are, more, are, are so important for your entire future existence. Mm. Yeah, so you imagine, like, let's say as a Christian, let's say as a Christian, you, you have this belief while you're on earth that as soon as you pass, because you've been a believer in Jesus' blood yeah. and sacrifice, you'll be up with Jesus at the right hand of God. You'll be in a place of 
paradise, say, conditions, happiness yeah. and, and beautiful bliss and and that you might even share with the rulership of Jesus over other people. Right? Let's say that's the, the underlying viewpoint that you had. And then you pass. And instead of passing to that place, you pass into a place where it's quite dark and dingy, a bit smelly, mm. and you've got a lot of other people around you with exactly the same beliefs, mm. uh, and they all believe the same thing, they all still believe the Bible and everything else, but the very thing you were promised yeah. or that you believed you were promised didn't come true. Mm. At that moment, you've come face to face with the reality. Yeah. But you might not yet accept it as truth. Mm. You might just imagine that you're in some temporary place. You might also create other beliefs like, oh, maybe I didn't do everything right and I needed to learn what I didn't do right according to the Bible. And so you might study the Bible even further to find out what you didn't do right, mm. right? Mm. There's lots of different yeah. things that you may decide in your mind yeah. as a way or a method to avoid the circumstance and situation that you're presented with mm. as soon as you passed. What I'm suggesting to any person who passes, whether they be Christian or Muslim or any other religion, is this situation or circumstance that you now find yourself in is a complete mirror and reflection of your true soul condition. Mm. Once you understand that and you're humble to that concept, you'll realise that maybe many of the beliefs that you had didn't matter so much as the love that you shared. Yes. And of this course. is the underlying truth, of yeah. course. Yeah. And, and this will help you be humble to the fact of, oh, I've made some mistakes. Now, the only real mistakes you can make are not mistakes of doctrine. So, in other words, you can believe in this doctrine or that doctrine or this doctrine or that doctrine and not really make a mistake. They might all be wrong, mm. but still you haven't made a mistake. The real mistake that you make is based around love. Yes. Whether you practiced love or didn't, that's the mistake. Does that make sense? So here he is again. He's trying <laughs> to nurse us. Now... If we understood that a mistake is not a mistake of doctrine, but a mistake of love, or if we put it more clearly, when we have been unloving, mm. we made a mistake. Mm. When we have been unloving, we have missed the mark of perfection mm. and therefore sinned. Mm -hmm. If we understood all sin to be the result of our unloving behaviour and not the result of a doctrine, we would find it much easier to yep. give up a doctrine Absolutely. that might be untruthful Absolutely. or unloving. So would there be a, a period of time, whether you're in the spirit world or here, where you go through a period of limbo almost? Almost, yes. Because almost, it, because you're beginning to close down certain beliefs and think, well, what do I believe? Is that when you start putting in the quest for truth, yes. asking the truth for then. then. Yes, yeah, so you see, before then you really have just read a book and believed mm, everything. Mm, mm. And that hasn't required very much analysis of your own part. Mm -hmm. It's just required a faith that the book is true. Yep. That's yep. all that's required. And when the, when the book is exposed as not being completely truthful, uh, you go, well, what do I believe then? Well, now you are going to be involved in a quest for truth. Yeah. The real quest of the heart, which is this quest for truth between you and God, yeah. that's the thing to engage, right? Yeah. Now, once we engage this quest for truth between ourselves and God and we stop going, oh, I've got to rely on that book, I've got to look mm. at this book, oh, I'll listen to that person or that teacher, and we start focusing on just this desire to know what the truth is, we'll also start seeing also and developing also a desire to be loving because uh, uh, we will start to see love as the truth. Yes. Right? Anything that's loving tells me the truth. So once we start doing that, we start going, okay, I am in my current location on earth or in a spirit world of doubt mm -hmm. because I've never had to engage this quest for truth and actually personally resolve to my own satisfaction, the questions that I'm now asking myself. Now, during that period, you're going to go through a bit of confusion. Mm. You're going to go, well, what is the truth then? Mm. Maybe Muslims are right. Maybe Christians are right. Maybe the Hindus are right. Maybe there's a mixture of what's all of that that's right. Maybe all of them are wrong too. Mm. Uh, what is it? How do I discover the truth? And you now, and if you engage your relationship with God, you will now engage this connection with God 
not trusting any book mm -hmm. and not necessarily trusting any man, woman or any other person on the planet to tell you the truth, but you'll have to engage this process of reasoning and opening your heart to love in order to discover the truth. Mm -hmm. And that would be very much more beneficial yes. <laughs> to every person on the planet than following a book of any kind. Of course, yeah. yes. yes. So, so whether we're on earth or in the spirit world, you, if you've had a, for, a former very certain belief and then you realise that that so-called certain belief wasn't as certain as you believed because facts are different now, they've mm -hmm. been demonstrated differently yeah. to you now, then what you would do is you go through, okay, instead of trying to desperately hold on to this former belief or just go to another one that's also mm -hmm. flawed, I would be better off engaging this really positive manner or way of discovering the truth with God and, in, and, and understanding that love, humility and truth are all hand in hand in this discovery process. And if I was humble to that process, I wouldn't be so freaked out yeah. or, or worried yeah. about engaging it. Yeah. But when I'm not humble to the process, that's when I want to hold on mm -hmm. for dear life to a belief that is obviously false or that is obviously causing pain. Mm. And, and this is the destructive thing of having a Bible or, or, or a Koran or another book that we hold on to for dear life, even though there's so many different interpretations of it, even though you know, there are so many teachings in it that appear to be unloving in, in their nature. We still hold on, hold on, hold on, because we don't want to let go. Because if we let go, then we're left with this process that we don't want to engage, mm. which is this process of going through the discovery of truth for ourselves. Mm. And the majority of people on the planet would love to be told the truth so they don't have to go through the discovery of it. Mm. And that's what I feel mm. the primary issue is mm. for me. And then the, the actual discovery of the truth is actually what really holds the relationship between you and God together really, really strongly. You, exactly. That would feed your faith so that you'd step forward knowing, not sort of hoping, but knowing yep. that God is always there. Exactly. Yeah. And as we discussed in our last discussion, mm. we basically have three baskets before us. There's the, there's the too hard, I don't know basket um, that is yet to be, let's call it the yet to be resolved basket. Yes. Then there's... I know for certain that this is a loving doctrine or teaching. Yes. And therefore it's the truth. Yes. And then I know for certain that this is an unloving doctrine or teaching and therefore it is a lie. Mm. There's those three baskets before us. Now, during this phase, this intermediary yes. phase, almost everything we come against might be in the I don't know basket. Mm. And, mm. and it would be a humble place for us to go, yes, I don't know. But it's also not a humble place for us to leave it in the basket. Mm. We need to resolve these questions because they're all very important questions for our future. Mm. So we need to resolve them. We don't want to leave them in the I don't know basket. Mm. What we would like to do instead is engage everything in the I don't know basket and try to resolve it enough that we yeah. can put it in either I know this is true or I know this is false. Right. Now, how do you measure that? Well, the primary measurement yeah. is always love. Mm. So, mm. so any doctrine of any type, any teaching of any type, that seems to have an unloving nature in it okay. would naturally be gravitating towards the false doctrine, mm. any doctrine of any type. Mm. But we've got to be careful mm. because sometimes our own definition of love is flawed. Yes, that's true. And this yes. has come from our childhood. So if mm. I've grown up in, a, in an environment where my parents belted me and said it was love, then of course my idea of love is going to be flawed. Mm. Mm. And that flaw will actually be imposed mm. upon my belief system. So. I have to be humble enough. So this is where the humility is important. Yeah. So we, we remember love was the defining factor, but we also have to be humble enough to know that perhaps my view of love is flawed. Mm. So I need to firstly mm. yes. probably revise my own view of love as a part of... So I put my own view of love in the unresolved basket, yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. the, in the I don't know basket, and we go... Is this view of love true? Mm. So is this view of love that you can be violent and loving at the same time true? Mm. 
Now, you pray to God about that. Mm. You, you, you ask for God's assistance to, to show you the truth about mm. this through your day-to-day -day life. And God will show you through your day-to-day -day life mm. whether that is true or not. And then you'll analyse how you feel. How do you feel when you're getting abused? Do you feel loved? Now, pretty much everyone would say, definitely not. <laughs> so, so therefore, and if someone was violent with you, like if I punched you on the face, would you feel loved? Absolutely. Probably not. <laughs> so, so then I go, okay, I know that when I am harmed violently personally, I don't feel loved. So, so me then believing that God is going to be violent with others mm. potentially is not a loving doc mm. uh, belief system, not a loving doctrine. And if it's not a loving doctrine, but it's in the Bible, then the Bible mustn't be true. It mustn't mm. be God's word. Because then there are the subtleties too, where you think you're loving someone, where you're actually feeding an addiction or you're um, not looking after your own um, self-love. You're not being self-loving. You're allowing them to um, perhaps project negativity towards you mm -hmm. when they're yep. going through a bad time. Yep. That to me is even more subtler. But even that can be measured because what mm. we would do is we'd put even that into the I don't know basket. Mm. Is this loving or is this not loving? Now, we might start out feeling that it is loving, that it's loving to help a person who's mm. abusing us, for example. And then after a while we go, but I feel like I'm being abused. I feel like I'm being used. Mm. Now, if, if, if this was truly love, would I feel like I'm being used? Probably not. Okay. Right? So maybe me engaging this situation is not the best thing to do mm. until I've worked out mm. whether it, to engage it is loving or not. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and again, if I reflected upon my own feelings and logically analysed my own feelings about my response to what was happening, there's a pretty good chance I'd be able to see in the end whether it's loving or not to be in that situation. So if every time I go, for example, let's say every time I go around to a certain friend, I come away feeling exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of friend that does that, right? <laughs> so you come around feeling exhausted and you go, oh, tired again, you know? And then when you think about going around to their place, you go, oh, do I have to, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> now, there's only two possible things that could be happening there. One is that you're giving too, so much and the person's taking a lot and you come away feeling depleted. Now, that's obviously not loving to yourself, mm. but it's also not loving to them. Mm. They think that they can take from you constantly and deplete you and they don't even notice. Mm. So the loving thing to do, firstly, would be to engage the truth of how you feel. So you go around to them and say, look, to be honest with you, I don't like coming around to your place. And uh, do you want to know why? <laughs> <laughs> now, if they didn't want to know why, I just wouldn't go around again. Yeah. But if they wanted to know why, I'd say to them, well, the reason why is because every time I come away from your place, I just feel depleted, like you've sucked the life mm. out of me. Like that's the feeling I have when I come. So now we've got some truth on the table, your truth. Mm. It might not be the truth. Mm -hmm. It might be that you're giving up your emotions to them for some reason. It might be that you have a lot of fear and that's the reason why you feel depleted in the situation. And, but you've now raised the issue. You've now in a discussion about what you don't know. Mm. Yes. Right? Yes. You haven't yet resolved whether what is the right or the wrong thing yet mm -hmm. in the situation, but you've at least raised the point mm. of what is right and wrong. Now, if the person gets all angry and defensive, then you go, well, this is the way, immediately you know, well, now it's way out of harmony. Now we're in the wrong basket. Mm. Mm. Right? Mm. I don't have to be here now. Mm. So you probably leave and you tell them that, look, now we're in the wrong basket, actually. You know, you, I need to leave now. But if they said, oh, yeah, well, I've never thought of that. Mm. You know, I've never considered why that would be and so forth. And you start working out and you might work out in the end that you're very afraid of them. And so you feel like you have to do everything they want. And that's what makes you feel tired. Okay. Or you might make out, work out that they're very demanding and angry all the time and you do... <laughs> have to do what they want, otherwise they'll yell at you. Mm. And either one of those would be in the wrong basket mm, in terms of love. Definitely. So, so you, you at least now have the ability to resolve. Now, what I find in most interactions is that most people respond angrily first to the raising of the question. So straight away you know what's in the wrong basket mm. and you don't even have to go down to the next point. Yep. But if they get to the next point, you get to have a lot of insights about the truth about yourself and what you really believe about mm. love. Mm. You know, if you believe that love gives even in the face of rage, and I say it continues to give 
even though a person is rageful and trying to reject what you're giving, then obviously it's a false belief about love because yeah. love wouldn't do that. Love, that's not honouring the free will. Yes. And if you keep on giving, keep on giving, and the person keeps on demanding, keeps on demanding, keeps on demanding without giving anything in return or without even any gratitude, that wouldn't be loving either mm. to yourself or to them because mm. you're creating a monster. Mm. And so that wouldn't be loving. And you'd recognise these things if you raise the discussion. But what often we do with almost every subject, Christian or otherwise, is we go, if I raise that, there are going to be people, and we sort of have that viewpoint like, you know, like that. I don't know if I want to raise these questions because I know there's all this and all that might happen, all this might happen. And so we sit silent. And when we sit silent, we can't resolve anything. Mm. So that I definitely suggest that people that they do not sit silent, mm. that they at least continue to engage what's in the I don't know basket yeah. as much as they possibly can until it's resolved. Mm. Until the right behaviour, you know, what is right or wrong is determined. Mm. Yeah. So that's what I'd suggest for people in terms of answering that question. That's <laughs> excellent. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Do you think it'll be a bit less complicated? <laughs> okay. Question number two. Yeah. Now, what daily practices could a sincere Christian follow? to enhance their worship and their soul development toward God? Yeah, I thought this was a pretty good question because it, 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 there are some number of daily practices that can help any person. Mm. And, and, I, and I feel these daily practices apply to all people on the planet, not just to Christians. Mm. Mm. But let's, let's look at two, the first two of them. If you, if you, in the Bible, there is a record of me saying, what are the two greatest commandments? Can you remember them? Uh, love you got love God with the whole heart, your whole soul, your whole being, yeah. your whole mind, <laughs> all your strength, and yeah. all your strength, yeah. and to love your neighbour as yourself. Right. So, so if we firstly look at these two particular things mm. as daily practices, what would it mean to you to love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength? Can you see that you can't love somebody you don't know? Mm. Like so. So my first. Uh, recommendation to any person is to get to know God, not to get to know the God of the Bible, because mm. I don't believe that is God. Mm. And I never have believed that mm. is God. Even in the first century, I didn't believe what the Bible said in the Old Testament was everything there was to know about God. Yes. And in fact, I knew based on God being God of love, that a lot of what the Old Testament said about God being Absolutely. God of wrath was obviously <laughs> false. Yeah. So, so how do I get to know God? That, that becomes my uh, a primary question. Now, my answer to that is by engaging in my day-to-day -day life the fascinating things that God has presented me in God's universe that demonstrate God's nature to me. Mm. That's how I do it. Mm. So how I do it is I, as I look around myself as I'm working out in the garden mm. and I look at all the different things and I learn about them and, and I ask myself this underlying fundamental question. What does this tell me about the character, nature and attributes of God? Because everything does. Yeah. Everything tells me something about God. Now, this helps me get to know God. I would also engage conversation with people who I believe knew more of the laws of God than I do. And I would reflect upon what these laws tell me about God. And whether the laws are false or true, you know, whether the person believes them fundamentally or not. Mm. So, so, for example... There are some laws uh, that uh, people present in Christianity that if I analyse them and, I care and carefully, I go, wow, it's really telling me that God's misogynistic, uh, you know, a woman hater. <laughs> now, is that what I believe God to be? Or is that what a God of love would be? You see, and it help so even, even learning the false thing about God can help me see the truth about mm, God. Mm. That's the beauty of doing this. So what I'd encourage people to do as a daily practice is to ask themselves the questions about whatever they hear, whatever knowledge they garner from the universe around them, whatever they observe, what does it tell me about God? Yeah. Then I can get to know God. Mm -hmm. If I can get to know God, then I can come to love God. Mm -hmm. right? So then I'm not just focused on receiving love from God. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on also feeling love from mm -hmm. God. Right? That's what a relationship is. A relationship isn't 
you just loving me, you loving me, and me just ignoring you. <laughs> That's not a relationship. <laughs> now, God has that kind of relationship with the majority of people on the planet, mm -hmm. where God's trying, wanting to have a relationship with every one of his children, and most of the children reject the relationship. And even most, a lot of Christians reject the relationship mm -hmm. because they're not engaging this permanent connection yes. with God. They're, yes. they're having, trying to have a relationship with God through a book, mm -hmm. not through their own personal experience. So what I'm suggesting, and what I suggested in the first century was identical to this, get to know God through the universe around you. Get to know God by looking at everything and asking yourself the question, what does this tell me about God? So that's number one practice. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you just did that one practice, mm -hmm. you'd learn a lot about love, a lot about truth, a lot about yourself through the whole process, mm -hmm. just that one practice. But I'm going to recommend four more practices. <laughs> <laughs> but that, to me, is one of the primary yeah. ones, getting to know the person who created you, your, your parent, your mm -hmm. true parent. The second one is recommended by that statement that you made from the Bible, which is to love your neighbour as yourself. So once I've learned what God's nature is towards myself in terms of love, then I act the way God would act in the situation towards others. Mm. And I value the other person as much as, but not more, than myself. Mm -hmm. And I value mm -hmm. the other person as little as, but not as... Uh, in, in the opposite direction. So, yes. so in other words, what I'm saying is I value the other person as equal to me, mm. not as less mm -hmm. and not as more than mm. me. Right? Now, a lot of faiths encourage us to put ourselves down mm. and value the other person more than mm. ourselves. Mm. This will always result in equality of some kind. So, for example, if you look at some of the Bible verses, they encourage women to value the husband more than themselves through this aspect of headship of the male. If you look at Paul's writings, they're basically saying that he does not permit a woman to speak in the congregation. Does he permit a man to speak in the congregation? Why, yes, he does. So why doesn't he permit a woman to speak in the congregation? Now, of course, Paul never said that. It was later on added. Uh to the Bible, but if we looked at it and we said, okay, this is a point of inequality. Mm -hmm. If I love my neighbour as myself, then I will love a woman as much as I love myself as a man. Mm -hmm. If I value my own input in a congregation, then surely I would also value the woman's input in the congregation. If I feel that I should be able to be a minister of a congregation, then surely a woman should also, if I value the woman as much as a man, if I love my neighbour as myself, mm -hmm. I should be able to allow the woman to also be a minister of a congregation. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Quite clear. Yes. yes. However, if I start choosing scriptures in the Bible, there will be many scriptures that disagree mm. with that. Mm. But if you look at my statement, which is I must love my neighbour as myself, I would not value the woman as lesser than myself, nor would I expect, put restrictions upon her that I would not place on myself. And also vice versa. As a woman, I would not think that the man is greater than myself or think that I should have more restrictions placed on myself mm. than the man has placed on himself. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this aspect of loving the neighbour as equal to yourself, mm. as yourself. Yes is a very important aspect to practice in your day-to-day -day life. It will help you determine so much truth. It will help you dismiss many of the so-called sacred writings of all sorts of books because they, are in, they, are, they promote inequality. Mm. They promote either looking at a person who's greater or lesser than yourself. You see the same problem historically with Christianity and other faiths where, where certain races of mankind were treated worse than other races based on whether they were cursed or not. So there is this underlying uh, justification of the, of the uh, slave trade during the 1800s based upon the scriptures about you know, Noah's, one of Noah's sons being That's cursed. Right. Mm -hmm and him being more black or dark than the others. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it was cursed because of his colour. 
and and the law of love of my neighbour as myself would instantly dismiss that mm-hmm. justification mm-hmm. as false. Mm-hmm. Because if I love my neighbour as myself, I would love my black neighbour as myself. Mm-hmm. And my, if we can call them Asian, Asian neighbour yes. or yellow neighbour, sometimes they refer to, although I don't understand why, <laughs> um, as myself. Uh, and any tribal differences Mm. that I would have would instantly disappear Mm. because I love my neighbour as myself Mm. as a practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would never go to war Mm. because I would never want somebody Mm. to go to war with me. And any resistance you may have against any any person at all, you feel the resistance, you immediately realise that that's the damage within yourself. Exactly. And to deal with that. Exactly, and that's where humility comes in. Which is my next practice. (laughs) (laughs) So the next daily practice is to practice becoming more and more humble Mm -hmm. each day. You see, it's no good recognising these truths about God. And in fact, you won't be able to Mm recognise truths about God or recognise truths about your neighbour unless you're humble to change yourself. If you have a whole set of belief systems inside of yourself that through this interaction with God and your neighbour, you realise can't be true, if you were humble, you'd give them up. Mm. It doesn't matter whether they were written in a book or not, Mm. you'd still give them up. Mm. You wouldn't hold on for dear Mm. life and resist them and even fight for them. Mm. You would give them up quite readily. And this is why the daily practice of humility is so important. Understanding what humility is. Humility is a lot about allowing yourself to feel your own emotions without perpetrating unloving acts towards others. Yes. Allowing yourself to realise conflicts in your own belief systems without perpetrating unloving acts towards others. Mm. Allowing yourself to see that you're probably going to have to change on one or two or more, most probably Mm. subjects, Mm. probably many thousands in the Mm. end of subjects. And that change is something that you're going to have to get used to. Mm. Humility allows you to see these things. And also having the humility to see that no single book can contain Mm. the infinity of God Mm. within its pages. So Mm. humility would dictate that as well, the seeing of this particular knowledge. So that would be my third daily practice, Mm. humility. Practicing humility. Practicing feeling your own feelings rather than trying to blame other people for, for your feelings. Yeah. Feeling, you know, how you're responding and seeing it as a, whether it's in and out of harmony with love. And if your response is out of harmony with love, seeing there must be an underlying cause that you need to address yeah. inside of yourself and, and being willing to address it, yeah. n- not ignore it, not, not run away from it, not, mm. not, not say it was somebody else's fault, mm. but mm. rather look at what's going on inside of yourself. Mm. So that would be my third daily practice. Humility opens you up. To truth. Yes. So truth is my fourth daily practice, okay. a quest for truth. And mm-hmm. um, my suggestion is to begin to pray not for things in the Bible or things in the Koran or things in, the, in any other holy book to be true, but rather to pray to know God's truth mm-hmm. in your heart. And humility will help you see it when mm. it is presented to mm. you. Right, so that so humility in a way is like a doorway that opens yourself to truth, and truth is the doorway to seeing what love is all about and actually feeling love in the end. So, truth is a very important, and the, the quest for truth cannot be underestimated. And this is why I said to, to that the truth will set mm. you free, it's not love that results in freedom. Freedom and love are the end result of the quest for truth. Okay. Right? And being humble enough to see it. Okay. Right? And, uh, and this quest for truth will enable love to be experienced. You see, if we're holding on to false beliefs, we cannot connect with truth at all. And in fact, you know, the Christian belief of connecting to the Holy Spirit, as we will discuss mm. later, is true, but we cannot even connect to the Holy Spirit if we do not have a quest for truth. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth in, in a lot of ways. It, 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 it only connects with the human soul when we have a desire for truth mm. to enter our soul. Mm. And so um, the aspect of opening our heart to truth and praying for truth is very, very important. 
and not being afraid to put things in the I don't know basket. Mm. In other words, not being afraid to say, I don't know the truth about this yet. Yeah. To be honest, there are billions of things in this universe that none of us know. Yeah. Well, you think about it from a Absolutely. perspective of mathematics, if the universe is infinite or if God is infinite, then it, then it makes sense that God has created a universe that potentially with a whole heap of laws that are infinite. And if that's the case, then I'm not going to know them all. Mm. Right? So I have to expect that almost everything in the universe is in the I don't know basket. Mm. And it's only through my process of discovery, through the process of love, knowing God, getting to know God's nature, God's attributes, God's qualities, learning to treat my neighbour as equal to myself and love my neighbour as myself, that I'll start to be able to determine what, through the law of love what truth may be. And once I do that, I will be able to experiment with the truth and then it will solidify within myself once I've experimented but not from somebody telling me. Mm. It'll be through my own and personal experiments with the truth. Yep. Then I can take the thing out of the I don't know basket and put it in I know for certain mm. this is true or in the I know for certain it is false baskets. Mm. Mm. That's when we can do it. So th this aspect of desire for truth I feel needs to be a daily practice. I feel the majority of people are very, very happy with the truth they feel they already know and as a result they no longer have a quest for mm. more truth. Mm. The problem with a finite book is that it mm. encourages such belief. It does too, yes. Because it tells you that if it's not there, then it's not true. Mm. And that is not logical when it comes to God's nature or Absolutely. attributes. But it is also not logical for our future because we're going to be then controlled by the finite limitations of the book we're reading mm. and believing to be true. Mm. So I, I would definitely say to people, this quest for eternal truth, this eternal quest for truth, mm. for, for, for infinite truth, is something that we must engage. Mm. Only God knows absolute truth. So it makes sense that if I develop a relationship with God, that truth will come to me more readily than if I do not develop a relationship mm. with God. Mm. Some very many famous people, scientists and otherwise in history, have had a relationship with God and as a result, receive truth through that relationship. Mm. And then the other practice, which I feel is probably the most important practice of them all. Pray every day to receive God's love into your heart. Mm. Now, this practice is very dependent on the other practices, yes. you know, in some ways, being engaged. But prayer in itself is a very, very interesting operation. Because what prayer does, and most people in this are not aware of this, even most Christians who pray and most Muslims and others who pray, if a prayer is sincere and from the heart, what it does is it opens the heart to love and truth. It actually has the physical operation of opening your soul mm. and allowing new things to enter the soul. Mm. And in particular what it does is it, it, it establishes a connection between your soul and God's soul. And now things can flow wow. from God's soul into your soul as long as the prayer remains. The prayer is a longing, passionate desire, mm. not an intellectual mm. word. Mm. So it's no good me five times a day praying towards the sun, maybe as, or I think it's five times a day, praying toward, towards, the, towards the east for God's, for, for, towards God. Or, as a Christian might do, saying a rosary or all those kind of things, if, if our mind is just engaged and our heart is not engaged, Absolutely. it has no effect on the soul. Yeah. For prayer to have an effect on the soul, it, we need to feel it as a feeling towards God, mm. as a feeling and emotion, emotional, passionate state towards God. So we need to learn how to pray and to learn how to pray isn't just write, reading off from a book or reading off from some kind of text a prayer towards God. Learning how to pray is about having feelings mm. towards God, mm. of wanting and desiring mm. certain things that are pure in their nature, love of God being one of them, the primary one, 
and truth from God being a secondary one and humility being a third. Yes. So, so if we long towards God for these particular things every single day and we spend time, give ourselves time that are apart from all of our day-to-day pressures where we just have this time with God, where we long for God's love and we long for God's truth and we long to become more humble people as a practice, not because it's a rote practice, but because it's a heartfelt sure. desire, then we will find we will grow in love immensely mm. and also to be, to be able to determine truth much more rapidly. Mm-hmm. And then all this stuff that's in the I don't know basket can be rapidly put yes. into the false basket or true basket mm. because my heart, as it becomes more and more full of love from God, I have the ability to determine what love is. Mm. Mm. And therefore, the ability to decide what truth may be, Mm. because truth is always loving. Mm. So I have the ability to determine truth as a result. But if love does not exist in my heart, and I don't have a desire for it, and I don't have a longing to receive it from God, then I will not have the ability to determine truth. Yeah, yeah. I'll only have my intellect and my own, our own unhealed emotional mm. condition to determine truth. Now, how about the reading of poetry and of other, other, other literature, say, to actually trigger that desire for God? Well, if after, the, after those five practices I've mentioned you have time left, <laughs> <laughs> and I suggest probably most people in the Western world wouldn't have much time left after those practices, then sure, do mm. anything that inspires mm. you. Mm. Do it, and, and in fact, do anything you possibly can to engage your will in a more forceful manner, in yes. a more firm manner and direct manner. Yes. And, and engage the things that inspire you. But, but to be honest, you will find that happening automatically if yeah. you do those prior yeah. five practices I've mentioned. Now, this is where you would actually, because somebody has actually asked, this question about the use of will. This is where you put your will into practice about using those practices. Yes, well, That's one of where... the primary gifts of love mm. is God's gift of free will to mm. us. Like, if you think about it, it is one of the most powerful gifts to be able to ever give to a creation that you've created. Mm. It's like what God has done is said, right, I'm going to create this creation, but instead of this creation doing what I want it to do, I want this creation to engage what it be. Yes, yes. Now, the beauty of that <clears throat> is remarkable because basically what you're doing is you're, you're giving up control mm-hmm. of the very creature you have made. Mm-hmm. And God has done that. Mm. God has given up the control of the very creature mm. God has made. Instead, God has placed a system, a, a structure, if you like, in the universe of laws. Now, the, the creature God has created, and we are the only creature God has created that can do this, can break the law or live by it, by choice. And God's given us this beautiful will to decide what we wish to do. Now, many of us decide to break the law every day. And God doesn't punitively come along and say, you naughty boy, you've broken the law. God knew right from the beginning by giving you free will that you had the ability to break law. God gave you the ability Mm. to break the law if you so desire. But God has also given you the ability through the same ability to live in harmony with the law. Mm -hmm. And when we live in harmony with the law, when we use our will in harmony with law, it results in happiness. And it also results in no restrictions. Mm -hmm. So as long as we use our will in harmony with the laws of love every single day, we will have no restrictions placed upon us. We will not grow old. Mm -hmm. We will not get sick. We will not have diseases. We don't need to die. Right. The reason why all those things happen that I've just mentioned is because we've broken a whole series of laws of love, Mm -hmm. which all have their own consequences for Mm -hmm. their break, Mm -hmm. for for breaking them. And if we understood better the use of our will in harmony with all of God's laws, which are loving, then the majority of people on the planet wouldn't avoid using their will in that direction so much. Yeah. Yeah. And it also is proof 
that every religion on this planet that exists today is breaking the law of God in some way. Mm. Because the adherents of such religions do grow old, mm. they do die, they do get sick, they do have diseases, mm. which is all proof that the law is being broken somehow. Yeah. And even those people who believe the Bible is God's word are following the Bible to the letter or to probably better said to the interpretation of the letter, they still get sick, they still grow old and they die, mm. which is an indication they must be still breaking at least one or more of the laws of God that are obviously not contained in the Bible because if they were contained in the Bible, then the person wouldn't have grown old and mm. wouldn't have got sick and couldn't have died. Does that make sense? Yeah, most definitely. So, so the consequences, well, what we see what's happening in the universe is a direct reflection of the fact that our day-to-day -day practices are flawed. Mm. And my suggestion is if we bring them back to those five basic practices each day and, and, and we engage our will in a passionate way to follow those particular practices, our entire life will rapidly change. We will receive divine love. We have the potential of becoming immortal, of living forever as a result of becoming at one with God only by, by engaging these practices. Any other practice we do, so we can, we can sit down and talk about doctrines until we're blue in the face, mm. it will not help us one bit in mm. gaining a condition of one with God. Mm. It may help us to determine truth and error at some point perhaps, but unless we engage these principles of love in our life, it, it is impossible. And unless we receive divine love into our soul, it's going to be impossible for us to ever to become at one with God no matter what we believe. Mm -hmm. Mm. No matter what practices we engage, no matter what doctrines we we firmly believe in our heart of truth. Yeah, yeah. So that's what the other practices I'd recommend. Oh, fabulous! Oh, now on a on a different note. <laughs> <laughs> Complete change of subject. Yeah. <laughs> Question number three. Yep. Um, when you were baptized in the Jordan River, what do you remember, and what was in your heart? Well, I suppose you know, I can list all the different things that happened then um, and also what I felt at the time. Mm. And obviously myself and John, had John the Baptist I'm mm. now speaking of, um, had, we're friends from a young age. Mm. I, I was his cousin. Uh, he was my cousin. So um, whenever we went to Jerusalem, John didn't live very, he lived not very far from Jerusalem with his parents until he became the preacher of yeah. righteousness that he became. And... Um, as young boys, after, I, after my family came back from Egypt, when I was around, uh, it was in my 13th year, Okay. Uh, my family came back from Egypt. That was the first time I met John and we became very fast friends very quickly. He, he was a, a medium of spirits. He could talk to spirits quite readily and I was fascinated by that, mm. of course, and, uh, and so because I could also speak with spirits quite readily as well. So, so we had many, like, engagements of conversations with spirits and, and so forth about all sorts of subjects. And, and so every time that my family went down to Jerusalem, and usually that happened once a year when we went down for the Passover celebration, and I, we would stay with John until my father got a house in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, which happened a bit later in my life. And so we would get to spend a lot of this time together. Myself and John would play together, we'd do things together, we'd, you know, we'd talk a lot about, you know, truth and what's truth and we, we you know even when we were very young we'd mm. talk to spirits and find out a lot of things as a result so we had a very close relationship myself and John John through his mediumship ability received a lot of channeling from from spirits of old uh, what you would call the prophets of mm. old you know so think and in particular the spirit of Elijah Elisha was John's um, guide I suppose mm. you would call him nowadays if you were in a new age movement so so he was the spirit who, who guided a lot of John's actions and a lot of the things John said, Elisha said through him, right? And, um, and, and perhaps if I use the right name for him, Elias is what we call him, right? So, so Elias had this uh, relationship with John. He was Elias being the spirit, John being the medium on earth. Yeah. And, uh, and so he would have many conversations and discussions. Elias eventually motivated John into understanding that, that John 
could be the forerunner, as foretold in the scriptures, in the in the old old in the prophetic books of the scriptures, to myself, in the sense that he could prepare people for me to speak with them. Mm. And the way he saw doing that was to talk to them about the principles of repentance and forgiveness and to talk to them about the need for them to start to understand the need to practice the law of God, you know, to understand and practice the law of God. Now, of course, John was a bit resistive to understanding the law of God at times, and he had a very uh, strong viewpoint of the Torah. He, 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 he felt the first five books of the Bible because they were inspired by, from Moses, mm. that they were inspired of God. And he became quite militant at times mm-hmm. about the belief in those particular books of the Bible. And I was far more liberal than he. Mm-hmm. He, he would often practice practices that I felt I didn't need to practice in mm-hmm. order to become at one with God. But he felt quite strongly he wanted to practice them, so he did. So in our later life, uh, we still conversed very frequently. And we were fast friends, although we had different opinions about what it meant to be close to God. His opinion was more focused around the, what you would call the Torah and the prophets. Yeah. And my opinion was more based around my developing relationship with God and my learning truth through this different process that I was discovering. But he also had spirits tell him that the process I was following, which he didn't understand at the time, was the process of, that the Messiah would engage. Mm. And in spirits with him told him eventually that I was the Messiah. So, so um, it made sense to me that the only person on the planet at that particular time, after I became at one with God, who understood anything mm. of what it meant for me to be the Messiah would be the person that I would share the experience with. Does that make sense? So at the time of my being baptised by John, I had, I had just gone through the process of becoming at one with God, a process which began in my early childhood and which was the actual one condition, which was me entering the eighth dimension of the mm. spirit world or the first celestial kingdom and the creation of what I call God's kingdom in heaven mm-hmm. occurred just before my baptism. Okay. And so there was a huge amount of things to celebrate for me. Yeah. Right? In fact, it was the only time I had a celebration actually in the first century was this celebration of my condition of one with God, which is a beautiful condition to be in from a personal perspective, because now you have no fears, you have no trauma, there's no, like, it's very difficult to, to, to mm. describe to another person what mm. the feeling feels like without them actually feeling it. But in addition to that, I knew the truth of all of what I've been engaging all of my entire life, so it was a fulfilment of all the truth I'd discovered. And it was also a feeling of uh, I'd now opened, I knew that I'd created a new sphere in the spirit world, the, the eighth sphere of the spirit world. So I knew that, that I'd just created a new location in the, in, in the spirit world which, in which only those who had received God's love to perfection could ever exist. So nobody else was there at the time mm. and, uh, and nobody else could enter that place in the spirit world at the time. And I knew that was a, that was a major mm-hmm. event from an, from, uh, in terms of a universal event. So there were all these personal experiences that I've just had. In addition to all these universal things going on that I knew were a result of the personal experience I've just had, that I had to celebrate. Mm. And the way I celebrated it, and sometimes I regret the decision now (laughs) because of the uh, way in which it's been interpreted, Mm. but um, the way I wanted to celebrate it was I felt it to be like becoming, the the, my description of it was being born again. Mm. And I called Mm. it the new birth, experiencing Mm. the new birth. It was like being born into a divine creature from being a human. So all of my life in the, in the, in the, Spirit, in the first century up until the age of just above 30, I was human, the same as any other human, born of, uh, of in the same manner and potentially would have died in the same manner and so forth as any other human, with, with one exception, and that was I had this desire to receive divine love into my soul and learn the truth from God, and that desire drove me until I became at one with God. Mm. And... Once I became at one with God, I knew I was immortal. So it was also this beautiful feeling that I could never die. My soul could never die. Right? 
So there was all these amazing events all happening at one point in time, and they'd never happened on this earth in human history. So for that reason, they were all a set of major events. Now, I decided to mark the event yeah. Yeah. with a symbolic uh, expression of the event, which was my baptism. When I, so I asked John, and he initially refused mm. Mm. <laughs> and told me that I should baptise him instead. But, um, but I said, no, you don't understand. This is my celebration of my cha- of the changes and, and my knowledge of my own immortality, my knowledge of, you know, that all of the things that I've been engaging up until this point were true, mm. my acknowledgement of the creation of the eighth celestial, the, the first celestial sphere, the eighth sphere of the spirit world, my, my newfound condition of now knowing that I was at one with God and feeling that condition and kn- knowing that now God would be able to express herself through what I did, which was a joy to mm-hmm. contemplate for me. And, and so I decided to mark the event with a baptism. And John, as I said, initially refusing to do such a thing, decided to do it, and I was baptised. Now, there was no dove coming out mm-hmm. of heaven and voices saying, well, that anybody else heard, let's say. Mm-hmm. I certainly heard many mm-hmm. voices um, of all of my spirit friends who acknowledged this new condition because they had yet to obtain this condition. Yes, that's right. And the very first people to obtain the condition were Elias and and Moses in the spirit world, and that's why I engaged them in the transfiguration. Was that long after? It was after, around about six to eight months after the, the, my, my own transition into the first dimension, into the first celestial sphere. So it was some time And that's after. why they were there, of course, at the Transfiguration. Yes. Of course. Yes. So they were demonstrating to spirits mm. that this position had been achieved. Mm. And I, was, I had earlier, through my baptism, demonstrated to mortals that it had been achieved. But in the Transfiguration, demonstrated to John and James and Peter yes. that, the, that it also had been achieved then as well. And this was a way of us letting... letting people on earth and in the spirit world know mm. that the condition of at one was a possible mm. and that God had reopened the potentiality of the soul's everlasting develop- mm. eternal development. Mm. Before then, the potentiality was closed. Mm. The, the, and that's what I meant by the death of the soul and the resurrection of the soul. Yes. The resurrection of the soul's potentialities to become at one with God mm. and therefore become immortal. Mm. And these things have all happened to me at the time just before my baptism. Now, of course, John didn't understand all of those things because he he couldn't feel them all, Mm. so he couldn't understand them. And it was only later uh, with the Transfiguration when Moses and Elias understood it that anyone else in the universe understood what I'd actually gone through. But it was a sort of a significant time for me. It was a personal experience. And so I decided to mark my personal experience with a celebration. And that's all my baptism was. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. Um, it was always different with you, I know. But it was was the symbolic act of repentance back then. Yes, for mm. John, but not for, for, for me. John. For yeah. John's baptism, Just, yes, but yes. not for me, mm. because mm. for me there was nothing to repent. Of course, I'd gone through the position of or the condition of repentance mm. and come out the other side mm. of it into a condition of one went with God. So my baptism didn't symbol- no. symbolise repentance at all no. and God's forgiveness. It symbolised the change in condition. And John's baptism was different, obviously, to my own personal baptism. John's baptism of a normal person mm-hmm. under those circumstances, and I say normal, that everyone's normal, it's just that I had received something that others had not mm. through my desire. But John's normal baptism was a baptism of repentance. In other words, a person acknowledging that they'd made mistakes yes. in their life yes. and desiring to repent or change yes. or, and make amends for their particular yes. mistakes they've made. But that didn't apply to myself and, no. and that wasn't the purpose of no. my baptism no. at all. And in terms of my feelings with John, I tried to describe all of these events that had occurred and while he had confirmation from Elias, the, the spirit who often he spoke with, um, that these events had occurred, he didn't really understand them. Mm. And uh, as a result, he continued mm-hmm. to preach the way he preached, mm-hmm. however, with one change. And that is we decided together at, at, time, at that time or just before that time that he would go before me into different locations and, and help people come to a knowledge of repentance and forgiveness 
and that would help prepare them mm. for the true, the divine truth of, of the reception of divine love that mm. I would prepare them for when I visited the same location. Mm. So we actually got together fairly frequently and planned where we would next visit and he would go ahead of me mm. and I would follow him and visit those locations after he. Mm. Even though that all occurred, he had his own followers. Um, he, yeah. he had his own followers who did not believe that I was the Messiah. Mm. And John, even though John told them that I was and, his, and, and assured them of his belief that I was, mm. many of his followers did not choose to follow me. Because his style was so different to yours. Very too. different, yeah. yeah. He was very, uh, shall we say, fire and brimstone yep. type of a style. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He did practice love too, but yes. he... he uh, he did have a lot of condemnation of mm. the religious leaders of the day mm. and the political leaders of mm. the day, which I actually warned him against mm. uh, because uh, I said to him that this was not the way. Mm. He, what he was condemning them for wasn't the truth. Mm. And I said to him that it could only end in bitterness for him. And, yeah, and it did, of it course, did. end in bitterness for yeah. him in the sense that he died prematurely, really, mm. as a result of his condemnation of, mm. of, of Herod, you know. Yeah. And, um, and in particular, not his combination of Herod, because Herod really didn't care or less whether, whether some preacher in the wilderness ca- preached whatever about him. Herod was still going to go down his very debauched <laughs> pathway in life. But his uh, wife, mm. obviously, uh, yeah. had very different opinions and was very concerned with public opinion. Mm. And as a result of that, and John's condemnation of her, yes. it led to his death. Whereas if John had been a bit more loving and focused on the truth, I doubt whether he would take, have taken such actions. Mm-hmm. Mm. But in terms of my baptism, as, you, as the question you asked, that was the significance of it for me. Yeah. Um, of course, many things have been made of it since, mm. um, unfortunately. Like I, people now believe that, you know, baptising a child is necessary and I don't see how that mm. can ever have any efficiency and helping the person with their relationship with God. And I also, they also believe that adults, but there's arguments about how you should be baptised even, whether you should be Dumped baptised or by full sprinkled. immersion or sprinkled. <laughs> the reality is that I walked into the water, but John sprinkled the water on my head. Oh, okay. But there's the assumption that because I walked in the water that that meant full baptism and so mm. forth. But, but, but in the end, none of that was important to me. And the reality also is none of it is important to a Christian and their faith in God and and their ability Mm. to receive divine love. Mm. Yes, Mm. yes. Excellent. Well, question four. In my Christian education, Mm -hmm. I learnt that sacrament and ritual were a way in which we could actually demonstrate the feelings that were deep within the heart and bring them and act them through your body. Yep. And um, I just wondered what your comment was on this. Yeah, it's interesting, sacrament and ritual, isn't it? As a, um, and if maybe you'd like to define sacrament for the people who... who... Well, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a visible sign of God's love coming to that person. Yep. But really, I know having... But really, it's connected to even the blood, the wine and the bread and all of those kind of things too, isn't it, to a degree? And to a degree, it's yeah. It's also connected to other belief systems. Isn't and it? it's connected to other belief systems. And it also depends on the condition of the person receiving the sacrament. Because okay. having been involved with it, I'd say 90% haven't got a clue and don't care. Yeah. Whereas you might have 10% who really honestly feel want it to as connect. a ritual. Yes. Like feel it feel as a ritual. Feel that feeling. desire. Yeah. 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 And and for the majority of people, ritual has become commonplace. Mm. And as a result of ritual becoming commonplace, of course, there is no heart in it. Mm. And when mm. there is no heart in anything, mm. of course, it has no benefit to the mm. soul whatsoever. Mm. So that's the first thing I would like to say mm. in response to the question. When there is no heart involved in anything, mm. then, of course, there is no soul-based response in, in, the, in the thing being practised and therefore it is of no benefit whatsoever to the person practising mm. it. Obviously, So a yes. person who practises sacrament or ritual without there being any heart in it is, a point, is, a, is of complete mm. uselessness mm. to them, mm. uh, of no benefit whatsoever. But let's look at the heart in it. 
and just see what, how this applies. Now, what happens many times for people involved with sacrament and ritual is that spirits who are also loving the sacrament and ritual um, are involved in, in motivating the heart of the person mm. into the sacrament and ritual through experience, mm -hmm. through an experience. So in other words, because, let's say, for example, as a, as a scenario, I decide that, that I would like to be involved in a certain ritual of the church. There's a spirit with me who feels very strongly that that ritual of the church helps them and, and will help me get closer to God. And so the spirit gives me feelings, mm. tingling sensations and other feelings from the spirit to myself. And usually when we feel it, we'll feel it enter us through the, the back of our, so, and, and it causes me to have an opening of my heart towards this ritual being a part of my worship of God. In the process of this worship of God, uh, my heart opens up towards God. Mm. As a result of my heart opening up towards God and my desire for God's love to enter my soul, God's love now starts entering my soul and I feel the tingling sensation over all of my body and a beautiful happiness and feeling of love and so forth that enters me as a result of that particular experience. Now, the problem with all of that is this. I then join the ritual with the final experience. Does that mm, make sense? I see. I then associate the ritual and mm. I tell myself inside of myself, I tell myself that the reason why I had this experience with God mm. was because I practiced the ritual. Mm. This gives me an emotional connection to the ritual mm. as a means of experiencing God. Mm-hmm. Now, the reality is that I do not need a ritual to experience God. Mm. We only need the five things that I've mentioned yes. in, the pre in my previous question. Yes. But because I've now in my heart associated the ritual or the sacrament as leading me to this experience with God, I then associate a belief system that the ritual is essential mm. to my continuing this experience with God. Mm. And this is where I now imbibe an untruth. Mm -hmm. Because what has really driven my experience with God was my open heart mm -hmm. and longing for that experience mm -hmm. with God, mm -hmm. not the ritual itself. Mm -hmm. The ritual helped me reach that condition through the mechanism of the ritual. But the ritual in itself yeah. will not work for every person. Of course. Because it's actually the feeling of opening my heart towards God that is the thing that operates, that draws the Holy Spirit as a connection and allows the love to flow. Mm. Until that point in time, I'm only experiencing an experience with a spirit who is also on the same path probably as myself, right. who also has very similar belief systems to myself. Now, if I become addicted to that relationship, I'm actually being distracted from God. Mm -hmm. And what I find a lot of people do is they have this, in, this ritual in the first instance. They connect with God through this ritual because of the mechanism I've described. Then they believe the ritual is what connected them to God. Right. And then they engage the ritual and then the spirit keeps giving them the encouragement for the ritual as well. And instead what they're now developing is a relationship with the spirit and sometimes they have the feeling with God and sometimes they don't. Mm. And they don't understand why. Mm. They're engaging the ritual every time, but sometimes the ritual works. Yes. And other times the ritual doesn't. Yes. In other words, other times the ritual fails. But they don't look at that. They don't go, okay, today the ritual worked. Yesterday the ritual didn't work. What happened today mm. that was different than yesterday? Mm. And actually finish up seeing that it's something going on in their heart. Mm that mm. happened, that was differently, that was different yesterday than today. Of course, of course. And also there is the aspect of truth that's involved. If we hold on to rituals that reinforce false beliefs, eventually the ritual will cause us to stagnate. Okay. In other words, we will no longer be able to experience the connection with God through the ritual at all, ever. Mm. So we might receive divine love, receive divine love to a certain point where, the, where we're not facing a truth. And then we think oh, the answer see. is 
to engage the ritual more. Yeah. And the more we engage the ritual, we still can't receive divine love anymore mm. because we're not realizing that it's not the ritual that caused the, or the lack of the ritual mm. that caused the operation of the Holy Spirit with our soul. It was our inability to understand the truth that's right sitting in front of us mm. that has caused us to mm. now disconnect. So more and more of truth is what opens up that heart. It's exactly. The, it's a keep, you know, keep breaking the boundaries and looking for more and more truth. Exactly. So yeah. there is no harm in the ritual mm. if the ritual helps me connect to God. Yeah. But as soon as the ritual makes me believe that I don't need to face a truth mm -hmm. in order to connect to God, mm. Mm. now there is harm in the ritual. Mm. For sure. And this is the problem that we face with regard to our rituals. You see, eventually what happens in most religious faiths is the ritual becomes the observance without understanding the operation of the soul. Mm -hmm. And when we don't understand the operation of soul, we can't receive divine love. So we get involved more and more in the ritual, in the ritual, in the ritual, in the ritual. And eventually a ritual results in stagnation of, mm -hmm. our, of our progress towards mm -hmm. God because we're now trying to engage the ritual rather than engage truth yeah. and humility yeah. in our relationship with God. We're trying to engage the ritual to get the relationship with God. And God doesn't have relationships based on ritual. Mm. Is this what causes what they call dryness? Yeah, I feel you see it happening in a lot of religious faiths where you have that initial inflow mm. of the connection with love and therefore the connection with God's love entering the soul. And there's that initial deep enthusiasm for the religion as a result, right? Mm. Which is an incorrect viewpoint in itself because it's not the religion that caused the inflow of love. It's your own openness mm. to God's love entering your own heart that mm. caused the inflow of love. Mm. But the religion assisted you in that process mm. through helping you understand some things, right? Now, when I engage the religion more and more and more, I then start believing that the religion is the cause of my relationship with God. And it's not. The cause of my relationship with God, stagnating or progressing, is completely dependent on three things. It's completely dependent on my longing for God's love to enter my soul, whether that's pure or not. It's completely dependent on whether I have a pure desire for divine truth. Mm. And it's completely dependent on whether I'm humble. Mm. They are the only things that it's dependent mm. upon. Mm. It is not dependent upon any religious observance. It is not dependent on any religious faith. Mm. I can be a New Age, Mormon, Christian, Jehovah Witness, uh, Pentecostal, uh, Muslim, Hindu, any religious faith, mm. or an agnostic, yeah. or even an atheist. Yeah, yeah. Right? And have, an, have a longing for God all, all of a sudden, and then bam, yeah. the experience yeah. will be experienced. So what this says is that it's the personal relationship with God that is the key part to the, to the whole experience. But what we do when we're a member of a faith is we believe the faith has helped me to have this relationship. And then we continue to engage the sacraments and belief systems and, and doctrines of that faith as a result. Now, many of these doctrines are opposite mm. to God's love. And so these doctrine, doctrines begin to stagnate our soul's mm. progress towards God in love. And so what we do is we had these initial beautiful experiences which slowly over time peter out into having no experience at all. Then we assume one of two things. We either assume we've reached the pinnacle hmm. of what we could reach. It's a pretty dead end, isn't it, if you feel like that at the pinnacle? <laughs> exactly. It also, it also negates the fact that God is infinite. Yeah, if of, you think course, about it. of so, course. So there is no such thing as reaching the pinnacle. Or we believe that we've now become stagnant in that faith and we start to look for another faith. Mm. And uh, we look for some other you mm. know, way of mm. getting the same experience, mm. in other words. Mm. Now, the reality is that if we truly understood what caused the experience in the beginning, then it's highly unlikely we'd, we'd be attracted to constant ritual and sacrament. But usually when we begin our relationship with God, we don't understand much at all. Mm. And so we do engage the ritual. That opens our heart, opens our heart to the experience. We have the experience and then we believe it's the ritual mm. or the sacrament or the doctrine or the belief system that mm. caused the experience mm. when it wasn't. It was actually our heart mm. opening for the first time mm. towards God and God's love being experienced that caused the experience. Yeah. 
And this is where I see like there's no harm in the sacrament and the ritual as long as it doesn't interfere with our knowledge of sure. what is the real reason why we had the experience. Sure. But as soon as it interferes in the knowledge of what is the real reason, now there is harm mm -hmm. in the sacrament and the mm -hmm. ritual. So mm -hmm. this is a, a conundrum, I suppose, for most religious faiths. Mm -hmm. You know, the Muslim religion has the ritual of five times every day praying mm -hmm. in, in, in a certain direction. And at the beginning, the first person who did that might have experienced some of God's love. But uh, many of them now uh, have the prayer and pick up a gun and go off and, yeah. <laughs> and fire at someone the very next moment. Mm. Um, so that, that's an indication that none of God's love has touched their heart. Um, so, you know, um, I just feel quite strongly that it's very important for us to understand that while ritual and sacrament and doctrine and belief systems can open us at some point towards this experience with God, they will not sustain the openness okay. with this experience with God. Mm. And that's why the people end up with this dry feeling mm. in the end or the feeling of stagnation, mm. let's call it. And the feeling of stagnation is telling you that your belief about how it happened in the first place was probably incorrect. Mm. The, there is a way to sustain receiving divine love for the rest of your existence, and that is by engaging humility, truth, and the desire for God's love to enter the soul without needing sacrament and ritual to sustain it. It's wonderful, that information, because when you think of, hum when you think of the, some of the feelings that you have when you are humble, to give you a bit of confidence to keep going and sort of thinking, oh, no, I feel terrible, I better back out. You keep going, keep going, because it's only going to increase that connection you have with God and exactly. you're open, keeping that heart open. Exactly. Yeah. The, the beauty of developing the things that we mentioned to develop in mm. question number two of this mm. session um, it can, it are innumerable and, and also uh, it is so in, important that we understand that these practices are far more important as heartfelt desires than they are as just a rote of course. practice. And, and the same applies to prayer. Prayer that comes from your mind rises no higher than your head. <laughs> and uh, prayer that comes from your heart mm. gets to God's heart. Mm. And, and this is the things we need to understand about God is God re is constantly responding to the, the soul of humanity mm. individually, mm. to each individual person's mm. soul. God's not responding to the ritual. Do you think it matters to God whether you get baptised or not? Do you think it matters to God whether you get married in a church or mm. not? Do you think it matters to God whether you take, you know, the bread and the wine every week or not? Do you, know, do you think it matters to God any of those things? Mm. In fact, any sacrifice you may make for God doesn't really matter. What matters is your desire mm. for God your love of God and God's ways, mm. your desire for truth and your desire to keep absorbing the new things that God has to teach you. Mm. They are the things that matter to God. Mm. That's what establishes a real relationship. It's like you and I, you know, if, if we just had a ritual every week that we went and had a, had a bucket of chips down at, <laughs> down at our local... Down at Utopia. <laughs> <laughs> And there was no heart in it. We just mm. made an arrangement that you rock mm. up, I rock up. We don't spend any time knowing each other the mm. rest of the time. Mm. We don't get to know each other. We just say, oh, how are you? You're all right. How am I? I'm all right. <laughs> you know, we have our chips and scoff them down and go off. Um, would you consider that in the end a very meaningful mm. relationship? Mm. Probably not. Mm. And, and the reality is God doesn't consider those kind of relationships meaningful at all either. Mm. Mm. What God considers meaningful is when we, through the exercise of our will that mm. God has given us freely mm. to exercise how we wish, decide on our own back without any influence from anybody else mm. and without any pressure from anybody else, we decide on our own back that we want a relationship with God. God's heart leaps with joy mm. at such mm. at, at our own contemplation of mm. that because the thing that is not God's is our, is our will. Mm. And the thing that is not God is, is, is our soul. Mm. God has given us the soul and the will to use how we see fit. And when we decide to enter this desirable relationship with God that we, through our own will, decide to enter, God's heart just leaps for joy because mm. another one of his children has decided for no other reason than God they want to, mm. that they want to have a relationship with their parent. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's 
brilliant. Yeah, it is <laughs> Thank brilliant. you. God's a clever guy. God. <laughs> God, God is very, also very precise mm. in everything God does. That's what I love about God too, this precision that it involves everything. God doesn't let us get away with intellectual reasoning that has no heart. Mm. God's not like that. People are like that. Mm. Facade is okay with people, mm. but facade cannot cannot ever be okay with God and mm. will not ever mm. be okay with God. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure.